I'm Karen Collins, and I'm here today at the SCAN Sports Cardiovascular and Wellness Nutrition Conference with Barry Brown, who will be presenting one of our major lectures today. Dr. Brown is Associate Professor at, um, of Kinesiology and uh, Director of the Energy Laboratory, right? Energy, Energy Metabolism Lab. Laboratory yep. at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and a lot of his research focuses on the role of exercise in preventing and treating type 2 diabetes and the role of activity or inactivity in appetite. You hear people say, oh I'm afraid to exercise because I feel like whatever calories I've burned in the exercise I make up for in, in eating later. What is, is there a physiology behind that or is that a mind game? Um, probably both <laughs> um, and there's definitely a real variation in the way people respond to activity. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that today, that there are some people who will start exercising uh, and they won't change their diet at all, and they'll lose weight rapidly. Um, there are some people who will start exercising and eat back some of the calories, but not all of them, and they'll lose weight gradually. And then there are some really unfortunate people who will eat back all of the calories and they will not lose any weight, and in fact might even gain weight. So there is some truth to that, um, although there may be more people who believe that they're I'm doing all this exercise and I'm still not losing any weight, um, then that in the actual reality. Mm -hmm. um, that's part. Well, sometimes of my patients, I feel like it's, but you know, they overestimate how many calories they've burned in the exercise. So they've just burned a hundred calories going for a walk, and then they stop for a muffin on the way home that has six hundred calories in it, and they can't figure out why they're not losing losing weight. But there's a there's a physiology to it too. Yeah, yeah, there is. Although I think you've hit really a crucial issue um, because I think you're right. The mismatch, the the lack of education part is people don't understand calories. They think that exercise expends thousands of calories, <laughs> and they don't realize how many calories are in a muffin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, now the difference in in the people who respond more is that the uh, have you identified metabolic differences in these people? <laughs> Two things. Uh, I'm going to start with the uh, less controversial one first. Um, yes, I, I think that, um, and this is work that I'm going to talk about today. It's not ours. It's actually John Blundell and Neil King and researchers in Australia and uh, the UK who have done a fantastic job taking the people who respond to physical activity with weight loss, the responders, and the people who respond to physical activity by not losing weight, the non-responders, and looking at differences in those uh, groups of people. And what they're finding is, if you start to look at things like restrained and unrestrained eaters, mm -hmm. you can predict which group they're going to fall into. If, really? you, if you start to look at uh, the people who don't respond with weight loss, um, they increase their craving for sweets, they increase their craving for high fat foods. You start to see that a lot of it's going on in terms of psychology, emotion, and mood, um, and that is really predictive of which people are going to be more or less successful at exercise-induced really? weight loss. So it's, it's the same mentality of, of an overly restrictive diet just played out on the, on the other end. It's yeah, not yeah. A, a difference in um, insulin sensitivity or... or there, there may be differences, but it looks like you know the broader questions of if I were to increase my physical activity, how much weight loss am I likely to see is more likely to be explained by those psycho bio, psychobiological kinds of things than by their insulin sensitivity or their fat oxidation. Wow. Um, the other piece, which is either interesting or infuriating, depending on whether you're male or female, is if you look at those responders and non-responders, the responders tend to be <laughs> mainly men, the non-responders tend to be mainly women, <laughs> um, which is, again, if you're a male, they find that interesting, and if you're a woman, you just find it infuriating. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, how does that play into this idea of the restrained and unrestrained and craving sweets or not craving sweets, I think, um, is still being worked out. Because you know, we don't really understand why. Uh, we understand a little bit of how, and that's some of our own work that I'm going to talk about today. If you look at starting a man or men or women on an exercise training program, we see differences in the hormonal responses almost immediately. Uh, Acelated ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone, responds differently in men and women. Um, satiety hormones respond differently. Appetite responds differently. Uh, hunger, satiety, all those things respond differently in women than men. So that's not just a matter of women being more likely to be a restrained eater than men. That, that's a physiology. Yes. I mean, there, there really seems to be something uh, more basic than behavior. It's actually, there's a, wow. you know, an endocrinological difference that you can see, and we saw it after four days, um, right away. 
you know, people have tried to explain that, you know, well, women need to preserve body weight and body fat for reproductive purposes. And, you know, that's a great story and it might be true, but we have no evidence for that. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, it's a good story that might yeah. be true.